Welcome, friends, to Podcast of All, your favorite Halo podcast. I'm your host today, David, and with me, we have a very special episode for you. So, joining me is Krista. Hello. Aaron. Hi, guys. And the one and only Mr. Troy Denning. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, so, if you're listening to this, I'm going to assume you know exactly what you're doing and who is who. But um, just for the sake of argument, if you've stumbled into us, um, Troy is the author of the Halo novels Last Light, Retribution, Silent Storm, as well as the short story Necessary Truth in Halo Fractures. So, welcome, Troy. And we've been calling that a trilogy. I don't know what the official rules are, but we're, we're, we, tell, we tell people you've wrote, you have a Halo trilogy. <laughs> you have that nice little narrative. It's not really a trilogy because only the first two books, Last Light and Retribution, are related. I so really, it's really a duology with a standalone. Yeah, we like to like insert necessary truth in the middle there and go. There's a little trilogy. <laughs> yeah, that that would work. That's what we've been telling everybody anyway. And if we say it, it's totally true. <laughs> Our word is law. Absolutely. So, Troy, you might mind telling us a little bit about yourself in terms of um, I did a little bit of internet sleuthing and hired a, a, a PI, of course, to track you down and find out all the kind of bits of information about you. So you. you <laughs> obviously have been an author for some time but you didn't obviously start off that way you worked for tsr which is the company that was involved in D, and you even kind of wrote for them so chris is a big D fan so i kind of wanted to get you two just talking a little bit about that and what was that what was that like how did that come about well i just kind of stumbled into that at college i went to um a college called beloit college in Wisconsin, I played uh, Division Three football, American football, so with the pads and the helmets and things. And one night, I was coming back from a game. We had been in Iowa playing a game, and we got back, I don't know, sometime after midnight. I got off the bus all beat up and sore and hardly able to walk. I was limping down the hallway to my room when I passed a couple of my dorm mates, rooms and they were sitting in their dorm in their room with their door open and they were on the ground they're on the floor playing this weird game where they were just talking back and forth and they had pencils and papers and funny looking dice <laughs> it is a weird game <laughs> yeah and I, I sat down and said what are you guys doing and they just kept talking to each other about this dragon that they were dealing with i sat and listened for a little while and then pretty soon they asked me if i wanted to play and i said sure and I, we rolled up a character and that night i killed a, my first blue dragon yes <laughs> as as a first level character so i think they were going pretty easy on me the dm was being were... a kind god <laughs> yeah but it, i you know i fell in love with the game and spent you know the next two years just playing it there were a couple of nights you know when i would stop playing D and go to take the finals <laughs> that uh, I should have been studying for <laughs> all night. Does that sound familiar, Krista? Yeah, it does. It does sound very familiar. And uh, it was one of those things because it was very close. The town of Beloit was fairly close to Lake Geneva. And one of the guys I played with that night was a fellow named Bruce Nesmith. And he went to work for TSR in, I believe, 1980. Um, he went to work in their computer gaming department which at that time was like on Ataris and, and Apple IIs. He was designing a game called Theseus and the Minotaur. It was a good game. I mean, he was an excellent game designer, but the, the technology at the time was so bad that you would walk into a room in this maze and it would take like five minutes to draw four lines, which represented a wall. Oh. <laughs> Your character was an act. It was back in those days of computer gaming. But yeah, uh, it was... You know, that was kind of his introduction to uh, TSR, how he, he went to work there. And he said, he one day, he let me know that they were looking for editors, and I was just about to graduate. So I applied and became a game editor at TSR, because my major was creative writing and English. And I went to work there, and work, one of my first projects was, do you remember the Endless Quest books? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, so my first project was Dungeons of Dread and Pillars, the Pillars of Pentagon. I edited those. You know, I was straight out of college and really an untrained editor, so I made about a million mistakes in them, but <laughs> they sold well anyway. That I know canon and the way it works. 
Yeah. So was this, um, did you mostly do it on the first version of D&D or did you ever go into like 2E or 3? I worked with the first version. We, we were working on first edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was really what I worked with most. Mm-hmm. And I edited a bunch of stuff for that. But I was this was in the time when they were also expanding into other role-playing games, like a thing called Gangbusters, which was 1920s role-playing, and Star Frontiers, which was kind of like a pre... You know, kind of like... It was based... I think it was a game that was based in the idea of Star Wars. It wasn't a oh. you know, Star Wars role-playing game, but it was based... It was a space opera. So we worked on that. After about a year of that, I became the manager of the design department, just you know, the game design department. So I was in charge of managing all the people who were designing the modules and the games, etc. Oh, look at you climbing up in the world. <laughs> well, it was it was an unusual environment. I was really enjoying it. My roommate <clears throat> at the time was, incidentally, the guy who had introduced me to role playing, Bruce Ness Smith. We, you know, we would go, we'd work on games all day, and then we'd go home and game different games at night <laughs> with <laughs> Bruce and and various people who worked there, Tom Oldvay and um, Zeb Cook and a lot of the old old classic names. Bruce eventually went on to become the lead designer on Skyrim. Really? Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he's been he's been quite successful. He stuck with the computer Good gaming design. aspect of gaming and has been hugely successful. You know, that time of working at TSR at that time was, you know, you look back at it and the, the names that have arisen out of there and the people that, we, you know, we used to hang out with, party and, and play games with is amazing. There's, you know, Margaret Weiss and, and Tracy Hickman were there at the same time. And I was actually the manager of design who, when Tracy came in and said, I want to write a 12 module series. I said, well, you're crazy. A 12-module series will never, never sell. But we were on a thing called Blue Sky at the time, which would, meant we'd caught up with all of our, our design work for the year. And so we were allowed to just go off and try to develop new ideas and see if anything really hit. So I said, okay, but go ahead and do it on Blue Sky. He did, and that was Dragonlance, which was kind of a huge... I've never been so happy to be wrong in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was a wonderful experience. You know, the artist, Larry Elmore, used to go over to his house on a regular basis for dinner and and just to talk and party. Keith Parkinson, um, Jeff Easley, Brom, all of those guys were part of that whole time and, and place. So it sounds like it was a really creative environment. Oh, it was. Something, yeah. yeah. It was, it was definitely the one of those things where you look back on and realize at the time it just seemed like it was, you know, your normal working environment. But I don't think that it's likely that it's ever been reproduced for again. You know, it was a real Camelot experience. When you were there, was it when you started actual writing novels? I have a little note there that says you wrote under a pseudonym. Yeah, what had happened was TSR had expanded really rapidly and they started to lay people off. I got upset and went off and joined. I quit TSR and went off. This was after about two years there. Got upset with them and went and started a game company called Pace Setter with some other um, people who would, who were kind of legends at the design department at the time. Uh, Mark Akers was the, the lead designer. And we did that for about two or three years until our accountant pulled some fast stuff and oh no yeah i got us involved with a grain elevator that went broke nobody really understood it but fortunately we didn't get in trouble with the sec but a lot of people did but that was the end of pace center oh, um, so i started freelancing after that point and the manager of the book department knew that i like to write fiction so she asked me if i wanted to audition for this thing called the avatar trilogy which was going to be when they converted from first edition AD&D to second edition AD&D. Okay. And, and they wanted to have an in-world fictional explanation for the changes that were going to occur in the Forgotten Realms. And so I said, sure, I'll audition for it. And I wrote like a 20-page outline and or 20-chapter outline. It was actually like five pages because they were very specific. You can only have one paragraph per chapter, et cetera, et cetera. And a sample of 
my writing, you know, like the first chapter. So I wrote that and submitted it. We took, they wanted everything to be blind, so they didn't allow anybody to put their names on the, on the submission. So I submitted it, and there were like 20 submissions from people they were considering. And I was um, selected to write the third book, Waterdeep. And because they were writing it, it was being written pretty quickly, I think in a matter of six to eight months. And they wanted to put all three books out, of, you know, in, in short order. So they had three different writers. And because they had three different writers, they wanted to use one name so they'd all end up on the sh shelf in the same place. Oh, right. Right. So they, we selected the name Allinson, which was kind of short for all-in-one. Oh. oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was when we first started, you know, that's my first and only pen name. And after that, TSR, they asked me to audition for two more books. One was the series, The Empire's Trilogy, where um, I wrote Dragon Wall. And I also had to audition for that um, series. And for, I think, my third book, uh, the Part C, I had to audition for what they called the Harper series, and I was selected to write the first the first book in that series. And then during that period, I also went back to work for, to, for TSR as a designer. All right. Yeah, and so I, during the day, I was designing games, and I was like when we came out with the big basic D and D set with the big it was a big box with the dragon on the cover, and you know you'd, you'd open it up, and it was. The rules were divided up into little cards so that you could learn them, at, you know, a small amount at a time. It was kind yeah. of to introduce people to, to d and I was looking that up, and that was supposed to be a big success. Yeah, it was a, a big success. I can't remember offhand what they called it, but I, I think it sold several million copies. And But also at the time, we were designing uh, Tim Brown and I and Mary Kirchhoff, who was the chief editor at the book department. We're designing the Dark Sun world. And so we spent like a week, a year meeting once a week for lunch and just talking about the ideas that we wanted to have in the Dark Sun. And then finally, after a year of doing that, um, we made a presentation to the, the executives and said, this is what we want to do. And they didn't understand it at all, but they said, you're so enthusiastic about it. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we did that, and we wrote the the Dark Sun box set, and then they wanted um, some novels to come come out with them. You know, at this point, I told Mary, I said, if you're gonna make me an audition for those novels, I'm gonna start writing for Tor. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to audition for those novels, and um, was selected to to write the first five Dark Sun novels. And as, shortly after that, I left. TSR again to devote myself full time to writing those novels because they were coming out quickly and I didn't wouldn't have been able to do them. So obviously your your passion was in the novel as opposed to game design. I love writing fiction more than than game design. I mean I love playing games, and I you know I've designed a couple of pretty decent games, but uh, I really enjoyed writing the novels a lot more. Yeah, well I would say you've got more more decent uh, novels. I would say. You definitely um, shine in that oh, area. Thanks. So you have pretty much been writing non-stop, it sounds like, since then. When I was looking up your list of books, there seems to be you were churning books out almost constantly. So did, did that really, that just kicked off in the early 90s, was it? Yeah, yeah. When I when I wrote, quit TSR to write for Dark Sun, from that point forward, I've been consistently employed as a freelance novelist. But obviously your relationship is still very good with TSR to be constantly selected for these books and these novels as part of the, that realm. Or the you know, realm. it's, yeah, it's been pretty good over the years. We ran into a hiccup after they were bought by wizards and moved out there. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I started writing for Star Wars. That's an excellent transition. About Star Wars, what did you think about Disney acquiring it and then making a lot of the novels that people wrote non-canon that was a big one i wanted to ask you too yeah i understood it i would you know i'd written 12 novels for the eu and some of them were pretty good and and you know they sold a lot of copies i'm really proud of that work but when disney bought lucasfilm or to write the to do these extra movies they needed to have a, a free 
rain with the story. Um, they couldn't very well, you know, the continuity when you have, there were 80 novels alone in Star Wars at that point. I mean, adult novels, plus all of the young adult stuff and the comics and everything. And it was all more or less coordinated through the EU and the continuity. They, you know, they did a very good job of maintaining the continuity in it. But when they were going to go back and write the new Star Wars films, I think that they felt that the, the continuity, that much continuity would be constraining in terms of putting out the new films, especially when they wanted to put out the new films in an era much closer to the original trilogy. Yeah. I mean, by the time I wrote my last Star Wars book, uh, Crucible, Han and Leia had grandkids. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, and their grandkids were becoming huge characters in the EU at the time. So that continuity would have really put the chains on, on their ability to tell a movie. And, you know, their audience was much broader than the EU. I mean, you know, we were selling to, you know, our audience, I, I always kind of looked at it as being a million people, which is huge mm. for novels. But when you start talking movies, you know, you're talking a hundred million people. So I can kind of see where they felt like they didn't want to be limited by the EU. And they didn't necessarily say everything in the EU is gone. They just said, we're not going to be bound by it. Yeah. You know, certain things will come in and be used and, and we'll, you know, stick to it where we can. But but they didn't want it to be a limiting factor. And I understood that. You know, I was sad to see the EU and the things I'd worked on so hard being kind of relegated to the, the backup status. Would you consider writing again if it was a, if you were approached for Star Wars? I know they started writing more novels again. You know, I think for the right project with the right deadline, I might. But... I really enjoyed writing for Halo. It's been kind of a nice transition. I find that the the Halo universe I have a little more freedom with in terms of exploring themes that I wanted to explore and handling the characters in ways that I would like to handle them. Pretty good. And how did that come about? How were you approached to write a Halo novel? I mean, the starting process... Um... For last light. As in everything in life, you know, it, it seems like for writers, there's no real set path to getting from one place to another. It just you just kind of move along, and then an opportunity presents itself. And for me, Wizards of the Coast had asked me to come out and work on a project with them, where I wrote the uh, oh geez, what was the name of that book? The one with Cleef. I'm, I'm I'm blanking on the title of my own book. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, you do have a good few out there, so that's okay. What kind of year are we talking about? Yeah, it was the Sentinel. The Sentinel. Project where they were tr transitioning once again from, I think they were transitioning from 4th edition AD&D to 5th edition AD&D. And by this time, I had stopped playing AD&D and, you know, I'd stopped designing for AD&D at 3rd edition just because they the became so focused on stats that it would take me longer to do the stats than it would to write the module. So I decided, you know, that I'm wasting my time doing that one. What I really love doing is, is writing fiction. So I stopped doing design for Dungeons & Dragons, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons at 3rd edition. But then, it, you know, they went, decided they wanted to go from 4th edition to 5th edition and wanted to do a story transition again. And so they asked me to come out and participate in that, and I did. While I was out there, I was out at dinner with a bunch of old friends that I had known from... My original TSR days, a couple of them who had actually worked for me when I was the design manager. Oh, yeah. One of them was working for another computer gaming company, and he said that, hey, I was approached to do a, a book on, on Halo. And he said, I can't do it because of non-compete clauses. And I said, oh, Halo, that's really cool. You know, because I'd read, I wasn't, I wasn't a, um, a computer game player, but I'd read some of the novels, and I you know, thought it was a pretty cool, cool universe based on that. You know, my reaction was, oh, that's really cool. It was really cool that you were asked. And he asked me, oh, you like Halo? And I told him what I knew about it and that I'd read a couple of books. And uh, a little bit, I don't know, a month later, I got an email from the editor asking if I was interested in writing the Halo book. And so that's kind of how I was kind of stumbled into Halo and do writing for Halo. That's cast. I've never considered, I don't know, I always put these authors as their own little universe. I never think of them. Yeah, they obviously read books too and uh, or could be fans of a series before they come to it. I 
that's fascinating that you knew it before it and that you were even prepared to write at the time. That's a nice way in. I wouldn't say new. I would say that I'd read enough of it to know that I liked it. Yeah, that counts. You, you know, I mean, but knowing something, I didn't know it then like I know it now. I wouldn't even claim that I know it now. I mean, there's so much material. <laughs> but... Troy, you have to know it now. You're making it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, would, you wouldn't believe the amount of time I spend on Halopedia. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, we were there all the time. You went from the Sentinel to Last Light Double Look at your transition between the books. What was the, the I imagine that was a huge kind of difference between writing for a franchise like that and a franchise like this. What what was it like just to actually write from one to the other? Now, most of my writing has been um shared world or or media tie ins. And every every tie in intellectual IP is run a little bit differently, but they have a lot of things in common. And it's probably better to to talk about the things that are common, and and that is is that you really need to immerse yourself in the material enough to understand what the fans are enjoying out of it, and what they what why they like it, and so that's what I always where I always try to start, and then I basically take a story to the people that that are, are asking me to write. Um, the story say this is what i'd like to do and then we go back and forth on it oh so you you, you came up with the idea and you kind of proposed it to them yeah you know sometimes I, i'm probably oversimplifying it in t and when i was working with the star wars people for instance they would come by and say we'd like you to write a story on such and such and they'll give you some guidelines and some parameters and so for instance if with star by star which was part of the new jedi order that was my first star wars book Somebody got in contact with me and said, we understand you like Star Wars. Would you be interested in writing some Star Wars stories? And I said, oh, yeah, definitely, because I am a huge Star Wars fan. So I submitted some samples to them to read. And, and then um, a couple months later, I got in touch and said, you know, did you like the samples? Uh, do you want to do something? And they said, oh, yeah, we love the samples. We're not quite ready to do something, but we will be. And then I, for I got in touch with them about once a month. <laughs> the next month, at six months after that, and you know they kept saying, "Oh yeah, we want to do something. We're not ready yet." And so after six months, I kind of was like, "Okay, this isn't going to happen." This was all before anybody knew about the new Jedi Order. And then about three or four months after that, out of the blue, I get a call and said, "Okay, we're ready to make an offer." <laughs> and I was like, "Great, I'll I'll write up a proposal and send you an idea for some stories." And they said, "Oh no." We know what we want you to write. And I said, okay, great. Tell me, what, what do you want me to write? And they said, well, we can't tell you until you sign the contract. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that it was um, it was the New Jedi Order, and it was, you know, nobody had heard of the New Jedi Order yet because the first book wasn't even out, and it was this big secret, probably the most secretive project I've ever been involved with. But so I really wanted to write Star Wars, so I agreed to do it blind. And then they sent me a... a a huge Bible, a uh, loose leaf Bible with all of the background for the New Jedi Order and stuff and the plot points for the different books. And they said, okay, you're right in the middle book and here's the plot points. You know, and I'm going down reading the plot points and, you know, I come to the one where Anakin dies and my, my uh, heart just drops. It's like, holy cow, they want me to kill Anakin. <laughs> and then I keep reading and it's Kurskant Falls and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. That's one of the ways that you can get involved in a project. I think the next project I did with them was the Darkness Trilogy where they literally just said, we want you to write a, a, a trilogy of books set in this time period. Do what you want to. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I said, so can I write, can it be about bugs? <laughs> and they said, sure. <laughs> Where we could have some from Jedi, <laughs> so we had a lot of you know a lot of freedom in that case. And then the next series I think we worked on was Legacy of the Force. They sent me an email one Sunday and said, you know, we want to do a new series, so we're looking for ideas. And I was in the in the process of finishing up the third Dark Nest book. While I was writing that, I'd kind of come up with an idea of where I would like to see uh, Jason go from that point. So just sat down that same evening, spent about two hours writing an email explaining what I wanted him, what I would do. And then by Tuesday that week, we, we had a new series and I had a contract on the way. 
for the legacy of the force. So it seems like every project is very unique and very different. Yeah, you know, it, it depends on how it evolves and, and what the genesis of the idea is. And with um, the Halo books, which I, you know, I know is what we really should be talking about. <laughs> no, we're just letting you talk. It's fine. <laughs> that was an interesting thing because um, Ed, my editor at, at uh, Gallery, had said, okay, yeah, we definitely want you to do something. We'll have a call with the people from 343 to kind of, you know, talk about what, what the parameters are and what, you know, what you might do. And at the time, my dad, who had been a small town sheriff's officer, um, he was the under sheriff and a detective at the time. Um, he was he was dying of cancer, so I was out there in Wyoming with him. Had a lot of you know his life on my mind when the call came, when came, when the time when it came time to do the call. And so we were talking, and they said, "Well, what would you be interested in doing?" And, and I said how would you guys feel about a detective story? You know, this was just because my dad, the detective, was so much on my mind at the time, and they, their response was immediately, oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> so that's how Last Light came into being. We talked about, you know, what time. They gave me basically the, the era that they wanted, the years that they wanted it set. After that, that was about all they, and they, oh, I think they said they would like to have Blue Team, which was Fred and oh, nice, yeah. Reese and the Gammas um, involved in the story which made a lot of sense. So that's basically the parameters that were set for Last Light. I went home and wrote up an outline, sent it into them, and they liked it and approved it, and I started writing. So at the time, did you know about, by the time you about like the next game coming out and the characters and that, and any kind of link links to what you were doing? No, I knew that there was a game coming out, but I didn't know much about it. You know, because all of that stuff is really kept on a need-to-know basis. Yeah. So they didn't really tell me much about it. I just thought, like, you know, the game featured Blue Team. Were they thinking to you then, yeah, we want Blue Team in because they're coming up next? No, I think that they were just wanted to make sure that it was tied tightly to the current Halo storyline. Yeah, sure. It just needed Blue Team to kind of anchor it as a Halo story. I, I don't think that they were so much concentrating on tying Last Light to Halo 5. Yeah. Yeah, but with Retribution, this the story was a little bit different because Halo Five was coming out or had just come out when I finished Last Light, and I, I was playing it and you know saying, "Oh, this is cool stuff," thinking about all the kinds of, kinds of stuff where I'd like to tie into it. I was about to ask you, did you have much experience with the games, or did it come about afterward? Well, I hadn't played any of the games before I started writing for it, but I, you know, once I started writing for it, I bought an xbox one and and started playing through the whole series you mean they didn't even give you an xbox one with the games that's a bad deal <laughs> talk. i'll talk to jeff for you for you yeah we better talk to jeff about yeah. that they gave me the games I, yeah i think they probably assumed they already had an xbox one <laughs> I don't know. but you know i started playing through the games when i started writing just because i wanted to make sure that i was well anchored into the gaming lore as well as the as the fictional lore and you know all of the other aspects one of the reasons, I have to confess, one of the reasons I don't play computer games is because if I um, get on them, I just, I never get off. <laughs> oh, yeah. We all know that feeling. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I started playing them and all, you know, the next thing I know, my wife's talking to me at four and five in the morning. Aren't you coming to bed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working, sweetheart. I'm working on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's working. Yeah, totally. You have, you have that excuse. We don't even have that excuse. You have it. You have to use it. What was it like? Because you read some of the novels beforehand, so you have a kind of different um, opinion of the Halo of Universe than most of us, because most of us play through the games and then go to the novels. Was it weird to kind of go from the novel world's straight into the games because you have more of a background going into these games which usually don't give you a lot of information as you're playing them i, I can't really tell you how different the experience was from coming at it the other way mm -hmm. you know when i went into one of the stories I, I had so much background on the character and stuff i knew who they were and so I, I think it gave me a little more attachment to the characters at a particular point you know and it's like oh yeah i know this guy i, I don't I know, you know, John, you know, you didn't want to get him killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it kind of enriched, and I did a lot. I was, oh, boy, did I get up those characters killed. <laughs> there was there were points in the first Halo game, you know, the the where you're driving the Warthog through the spaceship and you have to do those jumps? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took me forever. It, it took me, 
probably three weeks to get through that one section. That part's hard. Spartans don't die, so it's perfectly fine. They're just missing an act. Yeah. So I think that it, having that background and knowing who they were enriched the, the experience. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it changed it all that much. You know, it just you know, I just kind of knew who they were and knew a lot more about their back, their histories than I would have had I started by playing the games. That's kind of interesting because going into Halo 5, one of the big selling points that we all kind of loved was the fact that Blue Team was in it. His Blue Team is like the A Team. It's what everyone wanted. So what did you think about um, the kind of the voice actors and stuff like that? Did it match up to what you had in your head? or did it Yeah, make- I think so. I think pretty. I think they were pretty pretty clearly there. I don't recall playing through um, Halo 5 and, and thinking, oh, I wouldn't have done it that way or yeah, anything yeah. like that. Of course, I had been only working with Fred and the Gammas uh, because of the era. The rest of, you know, Kelly and, and Linda were kind of, I didn't concentrate on them in Last Light. Uh, they, you know, they were in the, they were in it, but I didn't write from their point of view. They're not big talkers. Anymore. So, yeah, so I wasn't really as attached to them as I was to, to Fred and to the Gammas. And, of course, that would have been cool if I had, you know, the Gammas would have been in that one. <laughs> Five, but. That is actually something I had marked down later on to ask you. Um, the Gammas, like, where did, how did you pick those up? I mean, I know they said a uh, blue team, but did they tell you that this is what blue team was? Or did you come to the Gammas yourself? wanting to write about them. Well, I knew that they were involved with the blue team at that era. I think that 343 three, three said, you know, we'd like to have you include these these three characters with uh, with blue team at that point. And so I write, started writing from bottom. And, and the more I wrote, you know, as, as I was writing them into the story, I kind of realized these are really cool characters. Yes, they are. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> you brought them back. I don't think it was my idea to bring them back. I think that... You can take the credit. It's fine. We won't... They won't know. Yeah. No, um, no I think 343 suggested putting them in, but I don't recall what their reasons were. And I just re- recall thinking they're a lot of fun once I get started writing with them. They kind of developed from there. You kind of had access to, like, I'd say the heavy hitters of the Halo universe for for these kind of books and stories. Was there any kind of restrictions, or was it totally free in terms of? Well, obviously, you were probably told not to kill certain people, but um, were you totally free, or what was that like? I was free as long as I stayed in continuity. Yeah. And you know, and there there were a couple of places where they said, well, they wouldn't really do this or that. But instead of saying you can't do that, they said, you know, if you adjust it this way, it'll work. Um, you know, if you do this, we can do that. And it'll work. So that was one of the things that really impressed me about working with 343 from the beginning is how well willing they were to um, try to make the larger world accommodate your story, which is which is unusual for an IP. Most of them don't really do that. They don't really find a way to make it work for your story. Your story has to fit their world as it exists in their mind. Which is tough because a lot of times it's still only in their mind and you don't know that. Yeah, that's true. You don't have access to all the details. But 343 is really great about saying, you know, we love this idea. It doesn't quite work as the way you have it. If you can tweak it this way, we can make it work. That's got to be kind of liberating and, I guess, helping you creatively come up with something else. and Or not something else, but coming up with your ideas and where you're going to take the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It really is. You know, when we did Retribution, they, the parameters they gave me were, again, the, the dates that they wanted it set in. They wanted me to use the same set of characters. So they essentially asked you for a sequel? They were looking for that, really, when they came to you? Yeah, they wanted to have Caster in there. They wanted to have Intrepid Eye. And I said, you, you know, it seems like a good idea. I mean, you've got... <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll write a book for you. No problem. <laughs> this is a good idea. So, we, we, you know, we said that. And then I was, I would, you know, I was fresh off of playing Halo 5. And I said, can I, you know, play with the Argent Moon and uh, the Asteroidia? And they said, yeah. And then also and the space station where the governor was. I wanted to play with that. I'm, I'm, the name of the station is slipping my slipping my memory right now it is also slipping mine krista come on tag in uh, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, meridian meridian station yeah and meridian yeah i wanted to play with those and you know 
I asked, and I knew that there wasn't a lot of, at least not, I couldn't find a lot of background on them. And so I said, can I play with these things? And they said, maybe. <laughs> so I wrote that into the outline, and they're like, yeah, that works. And so they let me kind of come up with that backstory and tie a lot of that, you know, the story of the um, Asteroidia into the mythology and the lore which I, I really enjoyed doing that's pretty cool specifically then when it comes to like writing characters in this universe i imagine it's very different than working with the characters of say like star wars where it's more kind of black and white in star wars and i'd say there's a lot more wiggle room for characters maybe in in halo or would you agree you know you, you have to stay true to the heart of the character no matter where you're you're working you know if i'm writing han solo i can't suddenly make him a cheerfully law-abiding citizen yeah so you have to you have to stay true to the heart of the character and that's true i think no matter when you're working with a pre-established character from any any ip then you you pretty much have to stay true to the heart of the character and and even to the details as much as you can and i try to do that with you know with all of the blue team and all of the spartans and and uh, you know, like Sergeant Johnson, try to do stay true to everything that I know about them. Sometimes there are you know little conflicts that already exist in the in the IP. No way, I don't believe you. <laughs> and when I when I come across those, I try to you know find a way to resolve them because that's always kind of a cool thing to do. But again, you know, I think I think the only difference in approach is that I'm pretty confident if I need to do something. To make a story work, that three four three is going to try to find a way to make it make it happen. You know, find a way that we can make it happen. I get from this you're sticking around, Troy. So we have another few novels to look forward to, hopefully. <laughs> I you can't, com I can't comment no, on that. No, that's, but if you're you you tend to um just looking at your your books and the way you've worked, you tend to get a series that you like and stay in it. So I'm just working on that. That you you do a lot of books in a, in a in a series and yeah, with an IP. I think that's because. I don't work with stuff I don't like. I get approached to do quite a bit of stuff, and my first question is always, do I like this this environment? It has to be something that I like enough to want to work in before I'll even cons you know ask about deadlines or money or anything else. Yeah. You know, so when I get into something I enjoy, unless I discover something while I'm there, you know, in the first project or two, I tend to want to stick with it and um, because I like it. One of the things that I really enjoy about both Halo and, you know, and Star Wars was that the more you got to know about it, the more interesting it becomes. Does it, be, by extension, then be, get easier to write? Do you, do you enjoy coming back for more sequels? And... Oh, I enjoy writing. It, do, it doesn't yeah. get easier. It gets harder. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, because it's um, writing is this weird thing. It's like where the more you know about it, the more difficult it becomes. <laughs> it's, you know, you're writing your first book, you're making a ton of mistakes, but you don't know it. So you just write them, and then you know the editor tells you to fix them. So by the time you're writing your 10th book, you've made this huge list of mistakes. You've learned about them, and you're trying not to make them in the first draft. And so that slows you down because you you write along and say, oh, shit, I can't do that. That's, you know, that char that's, character's not in character if I do that. Or, or that dialogue is boring, you know, where beforehand you just wrote it and then realized it was boring later realizing that you're making these mistakes kind of slows you down um, because you're trying not to make them. And then when you're writing in the, you know, the deeper you, you go into uh, an IP that has a lot of continuity, the more you learn about that continuity and the more little pockets you want to explore, the more you realize, well, I got to be really careful about doing you know, this and that and the other, because you don't want to violate it, violate the continuity. So the deeper you go, the more careful you have to be, I think. But but that results in a, in a product that's a lot richer, too, for the, for the reader. I definitely think so. And I think you do a great job of walking that line. And I imagine the Halo universe is, well, we all know it's rife with, like, stories and certain places contradictions. So it can be difficult. And I know they're always trying to address those. And I think they've, they've done a great job with all their books up to now across the different authors and stuff. You guys all seem to work very well. Yeah, I, I kind of think, look at the... You know, I looked at the Star Wars universe as there's just this huge mass of stuff and you drill down into it, you know, and you, you have to know so much. That's got to be intimidating too, I imagine. Yeah, and the, the Halo universe is kind of like an, um, an onion. You peel back one layer, then you discover there's a whole different layer, you know, from a different point of view. 
in it. And then you peel back that layer and discover there's something else going on. And that's always really interesting for me to try and incorporate into a story. You know, it's like when you write from an elite's perspective versus a Spartan's perspective, it's really two different stories. It's the same events, but their relationship to what's happening is so different that it's just kind of a delight to, to handle that as a storyteller because Zastulai's motivations for doing what he's doing are so completely different than John's. I mean, they're both involved in the same events, but John's doing one thing and Zastulai's doing another, and they just don't even... You know, it's like they're not even fighting the same war. Troy, you're doing an awesome job of answering the questions before I can ask them. So (laughs) this is great. I absolutely wanted to ask, what was it like from the shifting experience or perspectives of races? What was that like? And I imagine you were quite experienced with that with um, the Star Wars universe. That was kind of cool to see. Um, Definitely, I love Halo novels do it all the time. And I'm sure you're aware of shifting the perspectives between the races and who's as they're experiencing the same event the two sides of it or three depending on who's involved yeah yeah that's very true i think that's one of the things that's different about um halo and star wars is is that in star wars you know you have the jedi and you have the sith and they're both no matter what species they are they kind of have the same take on it it's all about the force and, and how it's being used um but when you get into halo you have, you know, the the covenant, which is is at least in you know initially, it's all about the religion and the humanity is like they they don't even understand, you know. Okay, somebody mentioned that this is about religion, but as far as we're about, it's genocide, and that you know that gives you such two different perspectives on the on the story that every time you you know you switch perspectives, you have to you have to switch mindsets. Because when you know when you're writing from the Sanghaley viewpoint, it is totally different than writing from the Spartan viewpoint. Their 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 goals, the way they they think about war, the way the way they think about life, it is so different. And I think that's one of the things that I find incredibly rich about the Halo universe is that the the species do have points of view that actually make sense for their species and they seem to have a um, very unique perspectives as well each individual race even though they're all part of one whole i found that kind of fascinating as well when you break into the covenant and see whose job is what and why they're doing what they're doing exactly i mean the, you know you're comparing the jirohane to the song Haley, it's surprised that they lasted working together as long as they did two di- totally different kinds of races you've transitioned very nicely into another thing i wanted to ask you about you're one of the this first slash second author, we were also talking to um, Tobias Buckle before about some of his books, but you created very iconic brute characters that tip- that break the mold of what is typically expected of a brute. I wanted to kind of ask you about that, like where did that come from? And obviously we quite enjoyed seeing Castor and, um, and Arunas and how they work together. You know, I guess it comes from, to me, Castor isn't really break the mold as, of a Jirohani so much as He's just explored in more detail. He's still very much a Jirohani. I mean, he's all about honor, fierceness. But, you know, you want to come to understand what his individual motivations are, why he's doing what he what he's done. And, in, you know, in exploring those in detail and making him a fully fleshed out character, I think that he becomes, you know, I don't think he's, I don't think there's anything about him that isn't Jirohani. And, you know, correct me if, if you disagree. No, no, no. I know exactly kind of what you're talking about. But he's a specific Jirohani. You know, he's not just a, a stereotype. You know, this is what, the, you know, I need a Jirohani for this role. So I'm, I'm going to name him Castor and then he'll behave like a Jirohani. No, this is a, this is a character who has his own goals, his own experiences, and his own way of approaching problems. And you had to sneak him in to Silent Storm, didn't you? <laughs> uh, well, I d- didn't really sneak him into it. I forecasted him. Oh, d- oh, did <laughs> he had to have a history, you know, because in last night I started him. He's got this long history that's hinted at, and you know he was active in the war at that period. So when I'm writing Silent Storm, do I ignore that, or do I, you know, kind of develop it? And you know, you're always when you're writing in a big universe like this. You're you're struggling with two things. One, you know, you you've got this massive universe, so 
does it really make sense for the same set of characters to keep coming together in, you know, your stories? But at the same time, you want to glue the thing together so that it doesn't seem like you're writing a new universe every time you write a book, a story. So what I try to do is to introduce story threads that carry from one era to another and where it makes sense for this character to have appeared in this story, you know, way back here. Um, and that's what, you know, pretty much happens with um, Castor and Hector Nieto is that, you know, they're part of the story when in Last Light and Retribution. And then because that thread has been planted, you know, it's it's kind of like this is how the story has carried through. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's always a tension, you know. Do, you want to make the universe seem big, but at the same time, you want to you want it to stick together and be glued together as a story. I'm kind of curious then because you talked about writing Last Light and Retribution. So whose idea was it then to, like, take a time jump back and go where you did with Silent Light? Silent Storm. Or Silent Storm. That's where my head's gone. Is it something <laughs> you thought about, like, to go back and sort of, like, prequel it? And I'm also kind of curious... Do you feel any added pressure that you're going from writing like Blue Team and the Gammas who were kind of side characters before you got a hold of them to like writing Master Chief? Do you feel any like added pressure with having to go back and deal with ultimately the main character for the franchise? First, the way it happened was basically after I finished Retribution, they said we'd like you to write a, a Master Chief story next. Yes. And then they said, that, you know, explain what they wanted. So that wasn't my idea to go back and you know write the backstories for you know I, I would i didn't write silent storm so that it could slip in the backstories for <laughs> caster and hector nieto but when i was asked to write you know the, the story of master chief's early experiences in the war i realized that we would have places where i would have the opportunity to explain what it, what caster's backstory was and explain what Hector's backstory, you know, Hector Nieto's backstory was. And so what, basically I saw opportunities to expand on what I'd already done. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, I've just, I always wonder with these things because you don't always get to see the inside. So I'm always curious to see who thinks up what and how they come. Yeah. When it comes then to writing Chief, how do you feel about, like he's, de he's a character that's existed long before you get your hands on him then? Do you feel like, pressure or do you feel like i'm curious do you feel more attachment to a character you create or do you feel more attachment to a character you get to develop that's already existed by someone else i love all my children equally <laughs> <laughs> when you're writing an iconic character like the master chief or han solo or you know leia solo or or fred and i don't you know you're you're aware that you have to get it right but i don't really look at it as as pressure it's like I just have to make sure I understand where he's been, where he's coming from, and where other, you know, where he's come from before. And then I use that as the core of his character and kind of develop. I don't want to say my version, but I, I kind of use the core of his character that that has come before as the hanger that I put everything else on. You know, and in his situation, I mean, you know, he's 15 in Silent Storm. So you know he's going to be a very different character than he was, you know, in the first books that I read of him, um, of Hall of Reach and et cetera. Yeah, and it certainly felt that way. And it was, it was an excellent way to see them, the Spartan Blue team, not, or the Spartans, not being very spartan at the start. You know what I mean? When they're first getting their introductions to the wider military, just how they're not trusted and just how they're, how they're treated was super interesting and not something I ever even considered that I wanted to see until you gave it to me. Well, you know, that, that just arises out of taking a look at the situation and asking yourself questions. All right. You know, John, obviously when, on his first mission, when Spartans are barely even known, he's not going to be this big mythic figure. You know, he's going to be, you know, this young 15 year old kid who's making mistakes and, and who people, you know, aren't quite sure of. He, you know, he hasn't earned it yet. So when you go back there, you you know, he still has all the things that, that make John John. I mean, he's still very confident he's in his abilities. He's still very um, assertive. But at this point, he's more likely to make mistakes because he's intelligent enough to recognize that he did make mistakes. He's more likely to learn from them. 
So when you start with those premises, it kind of grows out of the, you know, the seed that it was already there. Some of the other characters that you had were um, good, unique characters that I like a lot in terms of like, the new ones and how they add. And seeing them interact with them, um, pre-established characters is already, it's such a cool dynamic to see to see these things happen. Ian kind of wanted to ask, he's one of the guys, he's like our, our, our website guru. He kind of builds all the fancy stuff for us. And he really wanted to ask you what you thought about the insurrection and kind of how you approached them. Were they more like american revolutionaries or kind of modern day terrorists or something in between and i think sun storm was your first kind of encounter with the with the interaction if i'm guessing in terms of because your other books were based so far in the future i mean in my other books the closest we come to the insurrection is people who were involved in it way back when yeah i guess i didn't really model the insurrection on any particular revolutionary organization i just looked at them and what they were trying to accomplish and who they were, trying to make them grow from that. It's why the the you know in the scenes where they where they appear together, in the first scene where they appear together, everybody's kind of coming at it from a different angle. They want their own their own goals. They have their own agendas that they're trying to accomplish. And there's only two people in that first meeting who really are trying to knit the whole thing together. That was really fascinating to see as well. I think the kind of the beginnings of organized rebellion i didn't really think we would get anything like that in, in this book but um it was that was really fascinating to see yeah well it, you know it, it was kind of necessary uh, just because of the timing and it arose really kind of organically out of out of the time setting and what we were trying to accomplish you know we my original parameter was we want uh, you know a story you know that's a, that's a big story that shows how the humans felt and and what they were trying to do when the covenant invasion is just getting going as a fiction writer and a storyteller I'm t- i take that statement and i say okay i have to divide it up into you know three acts i have to make sure that it's character focused and how do you make sure that a huge story like that is going to be focused on john because that was the other parameter you know john has to be the primary focus and so you start to to build the story out from there and you know saying this is who John is at the beginning, and he's got to learn something along the way, and that's got to occur in the middle section of the book. And in the third section, is he has to make a decision that's going to impact who will be in the future. Then you start hanging things on it. That became the whole story of, right, we're going to go and take it to the, to the covenant. We're going to set them back on their heels, buy ourselves time to, to build a, a reasonable defense. So you have the basic story, and then... Base, you know, any story that goes through kind of a straight loop and has no surprises in it tends not to be very delighting. It doesn't surprise you at all. And so then you have to add something else going on, a subplot. And that's where I said, okay, well, it's got to be the insurrection because the insurrection at this point doesn't know what the hell's going on either. They've got their own goals and, you know, and they're going to try to use it, use the situation to their own advantage. And so that really kind of just organically grew out of what was happening at the time and and who the various large parties involved were one of those parties i want to ask you about because we do like a, a monthly book club so where we they take a book and we break it down and discuss it and chat all of us when we were talking were surprised that this character showing up and then we waited the whole book for them to come back in and it didn't happen so i was like what was going on here so you had lyrene castilla involved who was the wife of pressing coal who we haven't seen kind of since. And that whole story is very fascinating. So how did you just get her in there? And then we just sat and waited like, oh, this is a big character. Something else is going to happen here. And then just never again, never see her again. It would have been fun to, to have the time and on the pages to explore everything that was happening at that point. But the book would have been about 2,000 pages long. And... <laughs> There's no complaints here, Troy. Yeah, it would have taken me about <laughs> 10 years to write. Um, <laughs> so basically... She was there because, from my understanding of reading the backstory of the insurrection, she was really kind of a pivotal character. You read the story of her relationship to um, Cole and how she basically married him to be to spy on him. And you look at it and you go, you know, there's got to be, I mean, this is a pivotal thing in in the history i mean for, certainly for cole it's got yeah. to be more to that story especially when he was in the start of the novel and at that point it seems like all right she is really kind of an essential character to the growth of the of the insurrection 
so basically she's there because I felt she had to be there. But this isn't her story, you know? Oh, yeah, I know. I understand. I was just totally expecting that she was coming into it somewhere. That there was something with her and Cole happening in this book. Well, that's a good idea. Um, we're full of them, Troy. <laughs> you can have them. It's great. <laughs> no, but it, it was really... She was there because I felt that you couldn't have that meeting without her being there. But I didn't have the the space and the story wasn't... I mean, this wasn't... To squeeze her into the story would have been a real... You know, would have been a real... Um, artificial kind of twisting around of events she wouldn't have organically been too much of a part of the rest of the story hope that yeah, explains yeah it explains does, no that. it does i kind of cornered you there a little bit it's all right it's it's a good <laughs> legitimate question when you do bring a character like that in you do kind of plant expectations and this is just an expectation that couldn't be met in that story yeah i do want to say that story was awesome the way it was it wasn't like it was lacking something I, I loved where the story went and how and the focus of it it was just this character is big and you've mentioned this other character something's happening what i also wanted to mention we're going to kind of wrap up soon i know we, we've kept you long enough um ian has a had a question that he really wanted to get in so this little bit of a spiel is, is from ian so he says sorry it's kind of long you wrote one of my favorite characters in the halo universe colonel crowthers um he's one of my new favorite from silent storm i can't remember the last time i felt so many emotions for a character over the course of a single book he went from a person I hated to someone who I respected and to rooted for, and relished his impending victory and mourned his sudden demise, all in the course of a couple of hundred pages. How do you develop that? How did you come around with that character and that, that player line? And he says, do you plan out their backstory, their character flaws, general behavior ahead of time? Or does it come naturally as you write the book? Did you know where you were going to kill Colonel Crowthers when you started writing the book at the start? Or did that just happen as the story developed? Colonel Crowthers is, is very much um, an outgrowth of the plot itself. The one thing that John had to have happen in this story is he had to to go from being a hero to being a leader. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And so you needed somebody to teach it to him. And that's really what Crowther's function is. is He's a character that grows out of the function of the story. In that John comes in thinking he's hot shit. And he is pretty much hot shit, but he doesn't mean that he knows everything. (laughs) He's experienced and is wise enough to be a soldier, uh, to be a leader. And so Crowther comes in and, you know, he's the guy who essentially the rest of the, the military's lens for seeing John, you know, the readers and, and John and everybody who knows John understands what he is and how capable he is. But people who don't, who, you know, have never heard of the Spartan program before, they're going to just look at this thing and say, well, there's a big dummy in armor. <laughs> and so that's kind of Crowther's, like, looking at him and saying, okay, I've seen guys like this before. Put them in a tank, and they think they can drive. And that's not necessarily true. So he comes in being a little leery of John. You know, that of course, John takes that wrong and, and is offended by it. That shows up because it's his character, and that's why you end up hating Crowther. But then Crowther is essentially a, re- a very good commander in that he recognizes John's potential, sees his weak points, and sets about developing him into a good commander. And so that's, you know, Crowther really, he doesn't change. He's still the same person at the end of the story as he is at the beginning, but his perspective changes. And I think that that's why the, you know, the readers have responded to him pretty well in that, you know, he's a guy who has a very solid core, but that core allows for him to be objective and to understand and analyze and do the right thing. So he was planned, his arc was planned from the beginning of the story. It was, you know, it was part of the skeleton of the story. And I think I knew from the moment I started thinking about how the story would be structured that he would be a character in it and his demise was a shocker yeah that caught me yeah well that, that was planned from the beginning and and almost necessary um on a mythological level because basically he's the the gandalf the wizard who teaches people shows them the way but can't make the journey themselves and you know crowther is is that guy he's like he's like the guy with all the knowledge but He's not a Spartan. He doesn't have their physical capabilities. So he can never finish that journey. And for the character to go on on his own and develop into his own kind of hero, 
you know, his his spirit guide kind of has to diminish and, and disappear. And so that's Crowther's demise is very much a function of his purpose in the story. You know, the same way, you know, Gandalf can't cross the bridge or has to go away before everybody else makes the journey. Crowther is, is kind of that character. He's probably one of the most mythological of the characters in this in the story. Totally. What else did I want to ask you just before we let you go? You have to ask number eighteen. I know, I know, Chris. We have to ask number eighteen. <laughs> so, you have given us a little touch of romance, <laughs> and we don't get too much of that in the Halo universe. So, you had Fred and Veda have a steamy moment in, in Retribution. <laughs> How, where, why, and thanks, I guess. <laughs> that, that, repeat the last part of the question again. <laughs> um, where did this come from? Getting getting a Spartan too romantic, which isn't something we ever thought we would see or could get. Most stories have some element of romance in them. You know, that's for a good reason, is because most people are interested in romance to some extent or another. So when I started writing Fred and Beta, they're two both characters who, for their own reasons, are kind of shut down in the romantic category. But when you get a situation like that, it's often more entertaining to play against expectations. So, you know, everybody's expectation is is that Fred is not going to be romantic because he's a Spartan and, you know, these sex drives are chemically suppressed and he's just not going to be capable of having this a romantic relationship. And with Veda, you know, her, her own history makes her kind of unable to trust somebody that intimately so it you know it, i started to see them and as they were as i was writing their characters in the beginning i realized that these were two people who kind of had a lot in common spiritually you know down in their core and i thought well just fun to kind of play with that and allow it to blossom so that was kind of an organic thing that arose out of the story at the time and and the need to have some sort of um romantic element in the story did tree for tree or anyone over there ask any questions about this you know it's it's because really i mean they they were very clear and and, and i think they were even talking but they were very clear about there can't be a fully developed romance because you know they don't have um Spart- uh, spartans don't have a sex drive um or, or it's very suppressed is the way they put it but they didn't discourage me from, you know, from these two people establishing an intimate relationship, which I don't think, you know, I don't think that their relationship could be actually called all that intimate yet, but the potential is there. And there's a, a difference between emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. You know, we may never, well, may well never see any physical intimacy beyond, you know, the, the occasional hug. Oh, boo. <laughs> Chris <doesn't like> that. <laughs> <laughs> never say never. I, you know, I, it's, um, there's a lot of stuff in the way. Not least of all is our Fred's biochemical augmentations. Mm. David, I'm sure you can find something like that somewhere on the internet. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard that there are Fred Veda shippers and and Fred Veda fan fictions out there. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, which is fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't begrudge anybody doing that. You know, I think that they're kind of two souls that are destined to be together. I like that. Yeah, but they have um, a lot of things in the way, um, not least of which is, you know, their duty assignments are going to kind of keep them busy at the time. Okay. Troy, thank you very much for your time. You've given us a ton, a ton today. So much appreciated. Oh, you're welcome. I'm always happy to do it. I really enjoy writing in the Halo universe and talking about it, so... It's my pleasure. Oh yeah, that really comes across, and um, it's great to talk about someone like that. He was so knowledgeable, and um, I know you guys always get prepped and stuff when you're reading the books, and you have a big ass Halo Bible that uh, everybody wants to get their hands on, especially Colin. He's always trying to ask, "What does it smell like? <laughs> does it have? <laughs> How amazing is it?" For the most part, I use well. I do have like a huge Halo library, but I bought most of that from. You know, a reference library. I bought most of that at Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> Every once in a while, they send me a book when it comes out, and I haven't been able to get into town to buy one yet or order it. But a lot of my research just comes off of Halopedia. So, you know, I'll go there and get the basics. And then if I have further questions or question something, something doesn't seem quite right, I'll, you know, write my contact at 343 and say, hey, what about this? And they'll come up with an answer. You know, usually within a few hours. That's pretty great. And I know there's one or two people um, 
friends over at Halo Beta who'd be very glad and proud, I think, to know that that it's their work is being used to create more work. Yeah, <laughs> we're just gonna keep going back and forth creating more work for each other. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good, guys. Thank you very much for listening to us. Please come check out our website. And uh, oh, before we go, Chris, did you have anything else to ask? No, I am good. I think we covered everything. <laughs> I think we got a good bit. Again, thank you all. Please come check out our website, HaloPodcastEvolve.com. We have everything there. We know, and um, this episode will go up, I imagine, next week. So that'll be our episode one six eight. If any other questions you guys don't know what to do, get in touch. And Troy, is there anything you would like to bump into the show? You want to promote anything or you up to anything at all you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. I think uh, we've covered just about everything. Wait, there was one thing. I wanted to call out what I think was the most important line in the book, which you guys missed in your, your book. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Sorry, Troy, we don't have any time left. Uh, end of the show, guys. Uh... Bye. <laughs> I'm looking it up. I'm actually dying to know what it's this still is. here. I'm hoping it didn't get cut. Yeah, here it is. Here we go. 369 page. You okay, John? Fine. John sprang to his feet and took the shotgun back, then looked down at the mess that had nearly killed him. Just another friggin' alien. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was I listened to your um, book club discussion. Oh no! Said you were wondered why Zastulai didn't put up a better fight. Oh, we did. Yes, I had. I had to fight to keep that line. I didn't have to fight. I had to to give my reasoning for keeping that line in, and it was uh, John's reaction to almost being killed by Zastulai. Oh, it's not an easy fight, as maybe we were reading it. I yeah. Know, no, okay. <laughs> what I haven't seen anybody pick up on is is that that's kind of an expression of you know the way that the Zastulai and the Covenant looks at the war is like, oh, we're these honorable great warriors who are tracking down these spartan demons and stuff and, and like john kills one tough one and looks at it and it's like just another friggin alien <laughs> just, no big deal just like, yeah no it's well not only that it's, it's no big deal it's like he doesn't think that there's anything particularly honorable or great about fighting these things he just wants to kill them get rid of them and move on to the next battle you know which i think kind of sh- shows how his attitude develops over the next course of the war over the extent of the war that's an excellent point yeah so that was just me paying attention to your broadcast and... <laughs> damn it we appreciate it <laughs> they're just for us i didn't think <laughs> nope. excellent thank you very much troy <laughs> thank you right. um Talk. okay guys so after our scolding by uh, mr dan Engel, oh, I, was I, was <laughs> I was not a scolding i was i was just calling it out because i i thought everybody would pick up on that line and i thought it'd be one of the most quoted lines in the book and like it's gone over like poof i guess there's probably things like that in all your books you write something or you spend so much time on something and you're like this is this is the big scene and then people focus on something random like two characters kissing in another book (laughs) yeah it's it's that way you're always surprised by what what people really pick up on and love and enjoy and then the stuff that you plan you know the stuff that you think is really gonna bring all the themes out and, and bring everything to the surface and, and sum it all up. Um, just everybody misses. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've corrected us, so now we know. <laughs> so, um, no, thank you very much. Guys, we'll, uh, we'll leave it up there. And yeah.